So uh, first off, welcome to, to everybody from wherever you may be working from home. Uh, it, uh, as I was just saying with, with David and Elizabeth, uh, you know, a lot of topics are really important right now, but I think one of the, the key things I've taken away is seeing C-level executives from Fortune 100 companies, uh, interns, early career professionals, high growth startups, big corporate. We have people from all over the world that are all on this call to solve something that we all care so much about. And uh, we're gonna start a conversation today that might be uncomfortable at times, but it's gonna be really important for us to start that conversation together. Uh, and to see all the different types of people who are dialing in from all over the world to solve this is truly the first step and actually quite inspiring for all of us. Uh, so we can't wait to drive this next kind of 55 minutes. It is a full crash course. So hopefully you've got your caffeine in you to, to keep up with it. Uh, but it's an important dialogue and I'm so uh, excited just to see such a dynamic group from all over the world that are taking this time to, to learn together and to explore such an important uh, topic. So by way of introduction, uh, my name is Dave Wilkin and I'm the founder of 10,000 Coffees. Uh, and as a uh, gay founder of a technology company, you know, I went through my own diversity journey but what I can say is the last few months have been uh, quite uh, eye-opening for me. Uh, you know, I remember when I first came out and all the questions that I had to answer for myself, for family, for people at work. I know showing up at boardrooms and always wondering, you know, do I do I bring this up or do I do I hide it? And I've you know realized in the last few months, among many things, that um, as a white male, I get to choose whether I. Uh, disclose. And that privilege is something that I uh, have really been taking quite seriously to understand how I can educate myself. Because um, I think like all of us, we know that we have a lot of learning to do. Um, and for me, in the last few months, I've realized, you know, what I thought, how I was doing was I thought I was quite far along. And what I've realized is that I'm probably 1% of, of where I want to be and what I want to know and how I want to be able to learn. And so my kind of Brene Brown vulnerability in all of this webinar with hundreds of you from, from all over the world is that I want to learn with all of you and I want to do better. And I want to work with you to move from my 1% and every day find opportunities to get better. And, um, and this webinar is going to be a place for us to start. Uh, having started 10,000 coffees, you know, five, over five years ago, uh, we talked about democratizing opportunity and we actually painted that on our walls and put that on our door. And why we put that there is we knew that conversations with people was the root cause of opportunity. If you had access to people and you had access to conversations, that's how you got jobs, how you got opportunity. But the reality was that those things really happened through either serendipity or nepotism. And we started 10,000 Coffees because we wanted to put serendipity and put nepotism out of business. And we wanted to do better because we knew that we had to democratize access if we ever wanted to have representation and access and learning for everybody. And we knew we could do that better through technology and that is why 10,000 Coffees exists. Of course, uh, serendipity is something that happens a whole lot less as we work from home in this new world. And I think all of us, if we were to look at our leadership teams, at our people managers, uh, we know that nepotism is something that we can't rely on. We've got to do better. And we're going to explore that today. And I think about that conversation because if there's two people that I've been able to nerd out on that topic with years ago, long before it's something that you know we see every day on our social channels, it's with David and Elizabeth. Uh, these two people have taught me so much. They've inspired our entire company. They've inspired new features that we've invested in with our engineering team. And they're people that, you know, years ago really risked a lot of their, their capital, a lot of their careers to be able to do better long before we had the attention of the world like we do today. And so thank you so much to both of you for joining to share in this informal kind of virtual coffee with these hundreds of people to share your own stories, how you've been innovating and what you've been doing in your own ways. We know that we have people that are trying to solve now 
and trying to get solutions out as soon as possible. And what I know about both of you is that you've been long at this for years and years. And today is an opportunity for us to share some of those learnings with, with all of uh, the people we have on the webinar. So thanks uh, for joining me. And uh, I can't wait to, to jump into this agenda with both of you. So just to set the tone for what we're gonna cover, uh, I'm gonna kick it off uh, to just do a bit of a 2020 recap. What a year it's been for, for all of us. I'm gonna pass it to David from there to talk about how we can actually take actions uh, for change, then over to Elizabeth, and then we're gonna leave the large majority of our time for Q&A. One of the great things about GoToWebinar is that uh, you can actually introduce yourself using the chat. So uh, please do jump in and, and share, uh, share your quick intro on the chat. There's also a questions box. Uh, I get a live feed of the questions. Uh, so do David and Elizabeth. So please do share those and I'll facilitate questions uh, throughout. Uh, just as a reminder, I think a lot of you have sent us emails to say, oh, my colleagues wanted to join, but you know, schedules are tough. We will record this session and we'll make sure that we circle back with all of you with an email with this recording so you can share it internally with some of your colleagues who, who couldn't join. So, you know, a slide that I think we can almost call cliche is, is a slide like this, where, you know, I think at this point, everybody knows that diverse perspectives and diverse teams perform better. They're more innovative, they're more creative. Uh, but I think what we've realized is that this intent and this understanding needs a lot more action. And if we open up our Instagram or our Facebook or any feed, I think we're seeing that we have the attention of allies, of leadership teams and of the world to actually turn that intent uh, into action. But as we explore something like this, we know that uh, you know, one of the most pronounced fights that we're, we're really losing on is to help enable our black colleagues. And we really can't paint all of d &I with one paint paintbrush. We've got to look at each unique group who have their own unique challenges. But, you know, certainly what we can all, you know, understand is that one of the most pronounced fights that we need to do better on is to support our black colleagues. And that's a lens that um, I'm going to be taking in many parts throughout this presentation and to really take that specificity. Um, and as we look at some of the toolkits and actions is we got to look at our different employee networks or diversity groups, as well as our ally communities with different types of uh, solutions and different types of approaches because um, you know, all of those are, are different. And when we think about the different, the different groups in our organizations, again, I think our black uh, colleagues and professionals need our support more than ever. And we're gonna be able to dive into that in more detail uh, because as we look at these different groups, there's so much data to show that we've gotta turn the intent of our colleagues actually, actually into to action. Um, and there's groups that we've gotta really level up and support uh, a whole lot more. So out of all of this and the theme as David and Elizabeth and, and our team as we've been bouncing this around is how do we get off the bench? I think if you look at your leadership teams, your people managers, the intent to get off the bench is higher than it's ever been, but it's hard and it's often uncomfortable. And now more than ever, we've got to get off the bench and turn intent into action. And also as organizations or as team leaders, we've got to hold ourselves accountable. Uh, we have to hold ourselves accountable, not just with a social campaign that we might be doing now, but every month, We've got to ask ourselves, what are our leadership teams doing? What are our people managers actually doing to demonstrate their commitment to continuously learn and to hold ourselves accountable? That's not just something that we can one and done with a town hall or a, a yammer, ask me anything. It's something that we have to systematically think about and use technology to innovate around so that all of these communities can actually deliberately uh, have impact and have action and we're gonna unpack a lot of that throughout this next uh, 50 minutes or so. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm excited to kind of turn the floor over to David Simmons, who's, uh, I mean, I think many of you on, on, on various uh, nonprofits or leadership forums have probably seen David speak in, in some ways, um, but with that, I'll pass it over to David to kick it off 
um, knowing that this has been an innovation journey for you for, for so many years. So thanks again, David, for joining and, and over to you. Thanks, Dave, and uh, thanks to everybody who's taken, if we can just go back one slide, um, who's taken the time to join us today. I know a lot of my McKesson colleagues are, are on the line as well. I just wanted to uh, ask for grace as we start this presentation, because you can imagine I work for a very large company. Um, on Dave mentioned the Fortune 100, I'm, we're, we're in that group. Uh, we don't move as nimbly or as fast as some smaller tech companies do. We do move fast though, we proved that during, during COVID that we can move fast. But when Dave asked us to, to be a part of this, it was a small conversation on our experience uh, with networking and, and our, on our program. And it's turned into a very large conversation, uh, which is a little scary, um, but it's also very encouraging because what it says to me and to the teams that I work with is that this moment in our history is a moment where we're sort of bringing together an urgent issue uh, and an important issue. And so Dave's mentioned that we've been working on this for, for a long time. I want to be uh, candid. Uh, diversity and inclusion work as a practice is not my profession, as you could probably get from my title, um, but it's something that I live every day. And I'm supported remarkably well by a very rich, strong HR team at McKesson and DNI team at McKesson. And I just want to acknowledge the great work they do every day uh, to move our mission forward. Uh, in, a, in a way that's part. I also want to talk a little bit about, um, before we get into the content of our journey with this program, um, a perspective that my family actually shared with me when George Floyd was murdered and we were having conversations uh, via FaceTime and text around, you know, what people were doing and how things were coming together. My mom is my biggest leader uh, and I'm grateful for that. One of the things she said to me was, you know, David, I, I really don't want you to, to overstretch yourself. You know, you can't change the world. Um, and I think she said that in a very protective way. You know, this is an emotional conversation um, and she wants me to, to take care of me. Uh, and I thought about that comment and I thought, well, maybe, maybe I can. Maybe I can change the world. And then the next day, so this was on Sunday, the next day our global CEO had a call with all employees. Um, and at the end of that call, he said something that I wrote down and texted it to my mom. Um, our CEO's name is Brian, and, and, and Brian Tyler said to all of us that we can't change the world. And I remember I heard that, and I was like, is my mom emailing our CEO? Like, what is happening? He said, we can't change the world, but we can change McKesson. And that if we change McKesson and we change our environment, it's going to have an influence on the environments around us. And so I think as all of us talk about these issues of diversity, we talk about issues of race and we look at the severity of the task ahead of us, of the, the gravity of the task ahead of us. I want us not to be discouraged by it, but to be encouraged by the fact that we can change the circles of caring that we live in and try to expand them in a way that brings other people in. Um, so let's go to the first slide then about some experiences or thoughts that I have. Um, I wanted to just open with this concept and a lot of my colleagues um, don't necessarily look like me. Um, and have come to me and said, you know, how do I, how do I engage? How do I do this? How do I do it right? Um, and one of the things that I reflected on is that it's super important uh, as a leader um, at any level in an organization to create room for a multitude of identities. And what does that mean? It means that we as leaders have very long shadows and often don't appreciate that our actions, our words, um, and the way that we show up give other people license to be their full selves, give other people license to talk about who they are. You know, uh, this is a very famous uh, gif of Barack Obama. It's one of my favorites. And if you look carefully, he shakes the hand of the assistant coach of the US men's basketball team, and then goes in for a, a, a dab and a hug uh, to Kevin Durant, one of the best players uh, in the NBA. And the reason I show that is there's this, there's this theory uh, in diversity, particularly in corporate America called code switching where those of us from minority communities will shift our the way we present or the way we interact to make others feel more, feel more comfortable, right? And by others, we often mean the majority. And in this photo, you see the most powerful man in the world, right? The president of the United States, arguably, uh, most powerful, he was definitely the president, uh, shake the hands of someone in a more traditional engagement and then go to an environment where he's probably more comfortable with someone who looks more like him. And I say that to say that this is somebody whose power was indisputable. And yet there's a whole level of journalism and analysis of that moment where he technically code switched um, in an environment to make someone else more comfortable. 
in my time at McKesson, you know, I've been encouraged, and I say this not because I work there, I say it because it's true, I've been encouraged to be my full self. I've been encouraged um, to, uh, to bring myself to the party, as my old boss used to say. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily in an explicit way, right? It wasn't posters and, you know, rainbow stickers on the doors or, um, you know, uh, ERGs. It was through senior leaders celebrating my difference. Uh, and a number of them are on this phone. You know, I, I tend to, I was joking in the beginning of this, that presentation is super important to me and uh, the way I show up is super important. And I tend to be very expressive in the way that I show up, whether that's in the way that I present or the way that I dress or the way that I talk. And that was acknowledged and celebrated by senior people. And so that said to me that I could do it. And then I would do that in other rooms and it would, it would, it would, it would encourage other people to, to bring their full selves. And I remember, I'll never forget, I was in a presentation <coughs> And I was talking about uh, transformation initiatives that we were running at the company. And I very passingly mentioned my partner in the presentation, very passively mentioned my partner. And I could see someone in the room, eyes sort of dart. And then later on in my presentation, I mentioned a trip that I was on and I expressed his gender being he. And I saw the person's eyes dart in the room. And at the end of that presentation, uh, someone stood up to ask a question and she identified herself as a, a, a Latina American. I was in the US at the time. And she said for the first time in 20 years, she wanted to share with this room that she was a Latina. And I, I took everything in me not to tear up at the front of that room. The conversation was not about diversity. The conversation was not about inclusion. The conversation was about a strategy exercise and a cost saving initiative that we were launching at the company. But me bringing myself to that conversation and not being muted on gender, for example, gave permission to someone with more tenure at the company to take a leap and be their full selves at the company. And then that ricocheted into conversations around the office that day, and not about me, but about that experience. And so I say to all of us as leaders who have that power to create those moments, to continue creating those moments because it's those moments that matter. You wanna to go to the next one? Um, Again, you know, we, we are using 10,000 copies at McKesson. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the program that we're running um, to help facilitate these conversations. Uh, and a lot of our leaders, again, you know, we do really well um, on leadership diversity at the, I would say, management level. So when you look at senior manager, director, uh, first level VP, we're doing, we're doing well. We have a lot of work to do. Um, and we're gonna, we, we, you know, our CEO, in Canada and globally have both pointed to the fact that we will do better and we, our HR leaders are working on how we're gonna do that. Um, as you get to the senior ranks, the, the diversity in our, in our community is not where we want it to be and we're working to make, that, uh, uh, to make that different. And so those leaders who are in those roles now have often come to me either through email or phone call and said, how do I, um, how do I express or find the right language? And so one of the things that I shared uh, with leaders is to try to find points of similarity and difference as you connect with colleagues. So if you try to make this conversation just about race, for example, I mean, right now this, this webinar is about racial diversity and some of the facts that we're lagging uh, behind. If you try to make it just about race, you may be set up to fail, right? Because whether we like it or not, there are not that many uh, black executives uh, in uh, roles of leadership. We know that to be true, the data tells us that. But it doesn't stop you from connecting in another way. So if you are an immigrant to this country and can express that similarity through difference, it can be powerful. If you're an LGBT leader and you can express that similarity through difference, it can be powerful. If you're a female leader. I talk about two, I talk about four sponsors I've had at McKesson who have accelerated my career in a way that I could not have imagined. And each of them have been different, right? And then I have a sponsor who a lot of people know in, in a very public way who's an openly gay executive in Toronto. And I talk about the fact that those leaders took a chance on me. They reached into where I was and said, you've got some talent, you've got some potential. I'm gonna put you in a position to be challenged, stretched and demonstrate credibility, right? So I've talked openly about my relationship with Jamie at Navigator. I was working in the public service. I'd probably still be there if he didn't come to me one day and say, hey, you know what? I think you can do this and you can do it really well. And I wanna bring you into my organization unlock some potential. And I remember when I started in consulting, I was nervous. I didn't know why. And he pulled me aside after a big meeting at TD and he said, you're hiding your difference. And he said, I don't, I'll never know what it's like to be black, but I can tell you I know what it's like to be gay. And he said, if you keep hiding that, you're gonna hide 
some of the best parts of your identity. I need to unlock it. And that was the beginning of a very promising career for me in the practice that I'm in today. I talk regularly about Geneviève, who hired me at McKesson, a francophone female executive from the Gats Bay in Quebec, right? And you would, you would never know. You'd think she was from Paris, the way that she would show up in meetings. And she's a good friend of mine. And her and I both bonded over our difference, right? I remember, I'll never forget this, this lunch that we had where we talked about our origin stories. We talked about what it's like to show up and to be looked at differently or thought about differently. And Geneviève's not gay in any way, but she was able to understand my journey and then ask questions about what it was like for me to be at a company where the diversity may not have been what I wanted it to be and then help me sort of find my voice. And I'll mention, I, I was plucked out of a program by a guy named Vancy, Vancy Nagy, right? This name that kind of, you know, it's like Barack Obama would make these jokes about his name. This guy plucked me out of you know, a market in Canada brought me into our global business in a role that I would have never thought I could be in uh, and pushed me really, really hard. And I remember, you know, he recently retired from our company and I had an exchange with him. And one of the gifts he gave me was to show me that at the level that I was running at at that point, in large part because of his sponsorship, it was the work that mattered and that the culture got me to the place where I wanted to be. And now the work mattered a lot. So I'm grateful to them. And I'm challenging everybody on this webinar who's in a position to sponsor, to look into your organization, to find individuals who have earned the right to be there and have the credibility to do really well and give them the opportunity to demonstrate their excellence. Um, because oftentimes they wouldn't have the opportunity to do that otherwise. And that leads to the, to the next slide. You know, we have this discussion about merit and how does merit drive success? And you know, how do we make diversity work without challenging the credibility of diverse leaders? I have this expression that I often say with my team that we don't have to get ready if we stay ready, right? Uh, and, I'll, and I'll say it to this webinar. I think that the assumption that minority communities are not ready to leave, lead is an assumption based on a fallacy. If we look at the data, we know that, you know, black, so let's look at black Canadians. We make up 4% of the population. If you add up the representation in business programs, law programs, healthcare related programs, we're not at 4%, but we're there. And we're normally there at the top of the program because we are working hard to get there, right? And so what we need to do is support leaders with the, the social capital to navigate organizations in order to do well and to move forward. And so I challenge us to give leaders the social capital to be able to, to, to progress. And then I would say to leaders who are not diverse, um, you've got to be courageous in order to reach out and make that difference. Next slide. Um, we're building a toolkit at McKesson using 10,000 coffees, and there's four things that I wanted to share that we're doing. Uh, the HR team and our DNI team is creating a curriculum for leaders. So giving them the tools to be able to have the conversations with the data that matters and the process that matters. The second thing we're doing through the communications team in partnership with HR is creating these uh, forums for discussion, right? So we're using these office hour programs to have discussions. We had our first one yesterday uh, on DNI issues. The president of our retail business was able to host uh, 50 colleagues for an intimate conversation on DNI, and she's taken that feedback and sharing it across our business. And we've opened that up to a number of leaders, and, and that'll run uh, through the next months, few months. Um, we're building a uh, diversity roadmap that's focused on impact that'll be measured and communicated to our employee population. And again, through technology and through tools like 10,000 Coffees, our hope is that we'll democratize access to networks so that people can reach out and build their network. I wanted to just share sort of our experience and the success that we've had. So, you know, Dave uh, put my picture on the 10,000 Coffees uh, program, but uh, I think our entire executive committee almost is all have uh, 10,000 coffee office hours. We tend to have oversubscribed RSVPs because of the ease of use. Um, and the majority of our office hours, these are the ones that, that, that I facilitated, have 100% attendees saying they enjoyed the experience and that they'd attend again. So that just tells you that people are hungry for these conversations, they wanna do well. I wanna give credit to my HR colleagues in our diversity roadmap, they're leveraging the software to extend the office hour hosting capability to all of our pool managers with training so that they can lead these conversations front line to top of the house. We're expanding our ERG diversity networks to other uh, priority uh, affinity groups. And we're looking to scale up because we think that everyone needs to be part of the conversation. Thanks, David. Uh, that was, that was uh, 
another big reminder about how you know we might not be able to change the world, but we can change kind of the areas that we all impact. And I think whether it's your direct team, uh, your entire company, there's so much that that we can do. Uh, a lot of questions came in, but we're going to pause uh, pause those questions because uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Elizabeth Nelson, who uh, I think, as I I said on on LinkedIn, Elizabeth, you've been my innovation meets diversity meets technology go to guru. So uh, thanks for for joining us, and I'll I'll pass it over to you. Awesome, thanks for having me. And David, thanks for telling so many great stories. I love storytelling in the context that you put the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion in. Um, that's really impactful. For this part of the conversation, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, capitalizing on this intent, as Dave said, to get off the bench and to really do something. Um, and oftentimes, the first call in, in getting started to this is with our diversity and inclusion team at Thomson Reuters or with our HR partners. And um, more than ever, instead of trying to kick down doors to make that change, people are opening the doors and opening them so fast and inviting us in and saying, what can we do? How can we help? Where can I learn more? Where can I double down to make a difference? What should I be thinking about reflecting on? And those are all really great questions and we encourage that. We also are um, pretty candid in the feedback that there is no crystal ball, right? There's no magic box that we have hiding in DNI that says, ta-da, here are all the answers and this is what's gonna take us there. Um, it's a collaborative effort, it's co-creation, it's understanding and listening and learning um, and changing because the context of the world has changed dramatically. It's looking at what we've done before and what we're gonna do different this time um, to really get that accountability action and change. Um, and a really great call to action from um, our CEO, Steve Hasker is like, we will be part of the solution. We will do more, we will do better. Um, and that rally cry has really been embedded in how we're thinking differently about diversity, equity, inclusion, and our vision for the rest of this year and going forward. So if we look at that from kind of the role, right? We all play a role in diversity and inclusion at Thomson Reuters. We talk about how do we move from awareness, recognizing that something is there, something needs to be done. Oftentimes that's, um, you know, a sense of uncomfortability and being able to sit with that and understanding why, but how do we move from that to action? Um, and thinking about it in kind of within our world, it's three primary focus areas. It's around diverse talent. How do we know, grow, flow talent through our organization? It's in the space of inclusive workplace. As David mentioned, you know, we have the ability to shape what that work environment looks like within the walls of Thomson Reuters. What are we doing? What does that mean? What do we want to double down on? And then what are we doing to drive this in the marketplace and with our customers and our brand? Um, and right now, more than ever, we're getting that ask from even our customers, what is Thomson Reuters doing? What does your representation look like? How can we partner together to evolve um, a space like the legal market or the tax and accounting market? or corporates to, um, to do some of this work together because it doesn't happen, um, it, it shouldn't just happen within the walls of our community as well. There's, or within the walls of our organization, there's opportunity to drive this across community. So at the end of the day, we all play a role. Um, it's not up to just employees or allies or leaders or employee resource groups. We've got to take a part in that. And I want to kind of tease that apart a little bit in, in what I'm seeing. Um, both within the walls of Thomson Reuters and within the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We think about leaders first as an audience. Um, you know, it's it's setting that tone at the top. You know, that that rally cry that I heard from my CEO Steve Hasker to what David mentioned um, that he, you know, that the people are hearing at McKesson coming from your CEO. It's that you know, commitment to action and results and accountability and transparency. And this isn't work that is should be delegated, right? That this is DNI's work. This is really the work of all. And so we're, as we think about this going forward and the, the vision for the rest of this year and beyond, it's how do we make sure that this work is being led by our CEO, that it's a business imperative alongside um, all of our other market growth opportunities and product growth opportunities, um, and all of those important objectives and key results that we're running at as, as a business. One of those pillars is 
the work that we're doing in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and making sure that our leaders are aligned to that, that they're accountable for that, um, and also for its strategy and implementation. It's again, it's not something that lives in the world of of HR and Elizabeth as uh, you know a leader in diversity and inclusion. Um, and so we're talking about it differently, and we're building in those accountabilities differently, and that requires um, oftentimes you know leaders to reflect in in what David mentioned, what is that leadership shadow that they're casting? How are they um, how are they showing up as authentic leaders willing to hold themselves accountable and others accountable and are ready to learn and change and evolve? If we look at it from the space of um, our employee resource groups, ERGs, and at Thompson Reuters, we call them business resource groups, BRGs, I see this community really as um, an important piece of our community and culture sustainers. They're a big part of our status quo disruptors, part of our talent accelerators, inclusion incubators. This is the place where regardless of level, regardless of the domain in which you work, um, this cross-sectional group can really dive into topics that um, are addressing intersectionality, creating a space where diverse voices and experiences are amplified, they're providing access to opportunity to leaders to different talent across silos, and that's where connections grow. And so that's that's that that, that bottom up piece, right? And um, there's no time like the present to um, for all of us, regardless of where we sit in the organization, to start getting involved. And if we're in positions of power, to really empower those business resource groups to be those inclusion incubators to test new ideas to dive into topics in which we haven't explored in the corporate space in the past, to unpack what that means, and to make sure that there's a channel and, a, and an opportunity to um, raise new ideas and test new things. Because if we look at sustainability in this space, it's not about um, a hot topic of the moment, right? It, it is, but it's not just about, we're not doing it because it's a fad. Our employees need to feel heard and understood, and more so they must see that their thoughts and their reactions are coming to life in the workplace. Otherwise, um, you're all talk and, and no do. From an ally space, um, you know, we face similar issues that, that David shared at McKesson. You know, we are working to continue to diversify um, our senior leaders and what that representation looks like across um, representation of women, individuals of color and other facets of diversity and so we still have room like many other corporate companies to continue to grow in that space and see strides in that space so oftentimes our leaders are needing to serve as allies for individuals across diverse communities and um, allyship is really shifting from in my opinion being a bystander to an upstander it's somebody who's recognizing that something is wrong and acting to make it right and hopefully preventing it from happening again and again and taking it as a both and approach. It's both looking inward um, and driving self-awareness and assessing your bias and committing to learning and unlearning, but it's also then taking that outward action. It's taking that intention from that um, proactive learning and starting conversations, calling out inequities, getting involved in business resource groups and making real change um, and driving that change through the future and leaning into it with the same tenacity and the same dedication and the same um, you know, push as you would to reach your sales quotas, to drive market growth, to connect to customers. I think that um, often it's seen from, um, from all of these groups as a nice to have, or I do it when I have time, or you know, carve out extra work, right? This is really how you authentically show up, what conversations you have. And as David mentioned too, it's you know, you can be having a conversation about business strategy um, and bring your whole self, right? And infuse diversity into how you are showing up as a leader, as an individual, the ideas that you're challenging. I think from the space of a talent leader, right? This My role sits within our talent management organization and diversity and equi equity and inclusion roles sit in a variety of different places across the organization, but those of us that fall in the talent leader space, I think that there's um, you know, a sense of urgency to make sure that we're pulling the diversity, equity, and inclusion thread through everything that we do and partnering with business leaders to do the same. So we have an opportunity 
to consult and help drive that and, and bring that into life and, and help guide where that prioritization lies with other business priorities that teams have. Um, secondly, I really see us serving as structural inclusion architects. So we have the opportunity to shape what our talent management processes look like, how we know grow flow talent. We need to make sure that we're doing that from a lens of equity and inclusion. Um, it can be hard sometimes to pinpoint where bias is creeping in in those processes. And that's where the power of data comes into play. So doing some deep analysis, I think that could be, a, that's a whole nother webinar in itself, right? Um, and and secondarily, it's it's getting to know your people and having that anecdotal feedback to bring to life the data that you're seeing. Because at the end of the day, the work that we do in this space is impacting our people um, internally across the organization, but also our market. So there's um, an innate human aspect to everything that we do. And I think sometimes as we look to drive this work, that can, that can get left behind as we think about strategy build and data, 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 which is important, but it's not all about that. So as I, as I think about how, you know, we're, we're taking some of those key components and bringing it to life, we're really leaning into the, the role of storytelling in driving the story and bringing that humanistic approach to talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it's creating authentic, relatable connection points between our employees and with our customers in our external market. And I just want to share one example of how we're doing that. This isn't the end-all be-all. This isn't the silver ticket, but it's part of uh, a wide variety of things that we're doing um, to bring this to life. And this is a screenshot of uh, a social post that we have as part of our hashtag BU at TR campaign. And as we looked at telling stories both internally and externally um, this year and particularly right now, and again, bringing that human lens to diversity and inclusion work, um, we wanted to lean into the unique aspects and stories and similarities and differences that we all have. And so BU at TR is, for those of you that are familiar with the with the social channel Humans of New York, which are telling um, just stories of people, right, all around the world. It's it's our Humans of New York meets Thomson Reuters, and it's sharing and amplifying these stories and voices across our diverse um, workforce. It's highlighting what they value about working at our business, about their career development, about their identity, about the impact that they're making, both in the walls of Thomson Reuters and within the communities in which they represent. Um, and it's it's different, right, than other talent stories that we tell in, you know, a traditional way. Dave, we might talk about you. Dave, the CEO um, and, you know, founder of 10,000 Coffees, and this is what you do, and this is why you might want to aspire to be like Dave, right? And it's really kind of career first driven um, in that type of a storytelling. This is more people first driven. So this is my colleague, Andrea. She's based in um, our Minneapolis St. Paul office. And Andrea talks about being um, a trans woman and what that means to her and how that's impacted how she shows up in the workplace and what are the passions that she's leaning into um, to drive diversity, equity, and inclusion for the LGBT community. Um, and there are stories like Andrea's that we've been amplifying this year. Um, the story of my colleague in Costa Rica who has a passion for 3D printing and he's been making hundreds of masks for his local community and his colleagues in Costa Rica, our colleagues in Costa Rica have banded around him to raise more money for more filament so that he can continue to make masks. It's the story of my colleague, Eric, kind of closing out Pride Month for us, who is um, an open cis, um, cis gay man and talking about what Pride Month means to him more than, you know, rainbows and parades, but truly like what, how does that impact him at his core? Um, and this has been, opening doors and conversations um, at our business around diversity and inclusion. People are being able to understand the similarities and differences in new ways. Um, and the way we've, we've been able to connect with employees to share these stories is by starting to have a conversation. It's leaning into, in this virtual to, world today, having a virtual coffee chat, asking questions beyond the, the mundane, what projects are you working on right now? Uh, what's the weather like to truly leaning into um, into who we are as individuals. And so, 
you know, with, with the changing world of the work where we are having drive-by conversations in the office, we are getting lunch with people in person and spending time doing that. Everything is generally scheduled, right? There isn't that kind of informal social, um, uh, social aspect to work anymore. And the walls between um, work and home, that line there is completely blurred and often one and the same. And so we are using technology to get out of our way, right? To, um, to open new doors and have new conversations that we haven't had before and break down silos in which oftentimes you interacted with your core bubble. If you were in product management, you probably had a really good, strong network within product management, but you might not know deeper ends of our technology space or our finance space or business operations or sales. And so technology has allowed us through leveraging 10,000 coffees in which we've rolled out, gosh, just about 60 days ago to, like Dave was mentioning, and David, democratize access to opportunity to meet new people outside of um, the spaces in which you normally show up and to have conversations in new ways um, beyond um, what what might feel like the the normal kind of hi I'm Elizabeth nice to meet you this is what I do this is why I like it this is the products I'm working on right it's more so hey I'm Elizabeth and this is how work from home has been impacting me these are the types of conversations that um, I'm having in the spaces around my community both within Thompson Reuters and outside of Thompson Reuters here's what it's been like um, yeah, blurring that line between work and home. And so leveraging 10,000 coffees and other tools to increase connectivity for career growth, what we're finding is that in launching this um, about 60 days ago, we have almost 1,000 employees who've signed up proactively to have these conversations. We have representation globally from over 25 countries. Um, we've got some um, great unique aspects built into how we're thinking about democratizing access to opportunity and asking questions like, what is the preferred language you want to have a conversation in? Is it Spanish? Is it Portuguese? Is it French? Um, and, the rep and what we're finding through doing this and providing access to opportunity is that we're seeing a flood of um, diverse individuals from across our business resource groups and other groups raising their hand to want to have these conversations, to want to learn, to want to do more, to want to diversify their network. And so that's what you're you're seeing on the slide here is kind of our um, our early success in this space. And where we're looking to go is similar to what David is mentioning around having office hours and small group conversations to double click into these topics to um, to get more voices at a table to be sharing beyond the one in one conversations that we're having today. Back over to you, Dave. Um, amazing, and it's a big congratulations to to you who you know in in all the things that have happened have went live. Nearly a thousand people have opted in to have those conversations to democratize network. And, you know, as we shared at the start of this call, you know, we can't leave things to serendipity or nepotism. We have to democratize it, and uh, it's just been so so exciting to see the the toolkit that you went live with. Um, so with that, uh, we have a lot of questions and we have about 12 minutes left. So uh, feel free to continue to ask questions using the question uh, chat just on the, on the right. Um, and thanks to, uh, to all of you. We'll, we've tried to paraphrase them and, and get to it. But to kick it off, uh, maybe we'll start with David and then go to Elizabeth on this. What does accountability look like? We both talked about accountability for all different levels. What does that actually look like? Well, that's a, that's a tough I guess it's not a tough question. I think you know what accountability looks like. Accountability looks like in personal life. I'll say two things. What gets measured gets done. Uh, we know that to be true, right? Why we had a manager meeting yesterday and we measure our financial performance. We measure our, um, you know, uh, what we're doing from a technology perspective, from measuring our accuracy rate for deliveries with our customers. But if we don't measure uh, an investment in return on diversity, we're never going to have an impact. So that's a public accountability measure. I was reading an article in HBR, Spotify's changed the music as artists are paid pay not for album purchases, but for the plays of their songs. If you look at songs in 2019, they're an average of two minutes and 45 seconds versus songs in 
2001, we're an average of four minutes and 50 seconds. So measurement work. The other piece to that, which I think Elizabeth alluded to in the TR experience, our values matter, right? At McKesson, we have a saying that the work that we, the way we do our work is as important as the work that we do. And if it feels wrong, it probably is. And the sense I get from my colleagues over the last six to eight weeks, something doesn't feel right. So we have to get after it. Great. Yeah, I would lean into, you know, um, as we look to, to drive accountability in this space, it's being really specific as to the key results that we want to see. Um, so for us, it's some goals around increasing representation. It's specific indicators in our organizational health index and where we want to see movement on. It's our um, employee net promoter score and how and goals that we want to see in that space. And through that and, and being crystal clear on the key results that you want to see, then you can create initiatives and specific actions to align to that. And getting that done and getting those then results at the end of the day, that's where that accountability lies. If you can be crystal clear and have alignment, whether it's in a specific segment in your organization or company-wide, those key results um, for us are what we lean into to drive that accountability to say, okay, if we didn't hit our, our key result in this space, why is that? Was it because we deprioritized it? Was it because certain groups didn't take action? Um, is it because we're testing and what we tested and brought to market failed? You can't iterate until you um, until you, you measure something and those key results are, are it for us. And some of them look at measurements on a weekly basis. Some of them are monthly, some of them are quarterly, some of them are annually. And I think building out that cadence too and where you're having conversations and how frequently, depending on what those key results are, um, help drive that accountability aspect. That's great. And talk to me about uh, toolkit. We had a bunch of questions come in to say, you know, a lot of people on this webinar are building out toolkits. What are, um, what would you say are kind of some some actual things that are in that toolkit? If you can expand on that, um, Elizabeth, do you want to go first, then we can pass it to David. Sure. So for us, it's a um, it's kind of a multi prong approach. Some of it is around um, providing some guidance around how to have discussions in this space. Um, a lot of it too is kicking off, giving giving people a sense of, um, you know, a sense of being okay that you're not going to know all the answers. You mm -hmm. might get it wrong. That's okay. But it's about actually taking action. So giving that that freedom and that safety to take action um, is what some of our discussion toolkits look like and some icebreakers and prompts um, to kind of get started. We've got toolkits around learning and development. So where might folks want to double click into listening, learning, reading, um, micro learning pieces. Right now, we're as a business, we're going through a 21 day allyship challenge that's particularly focused around um, race and racial equity. Bite-sized learnings, you know, five to 10 minute activities that across the business, we're encouraging people to carve out some time to do. And that concept is around the idea of, you know, it takes 21 days of sustained activity to make it part of you know, your regular behavior and the regular way in which it moves from um, figuring things out to business as usual. Um, so some of our toolkits are around that space and learning and others it's around how do we operationalize this work? So we've got a lofty goal around increasing representation of racial and ethnic um, diversity at Thompson Reuters. How do we operationalize that? How do you think about that if you're in our um, customer success or commercial excellent part of our parts of our business? How are you going to operationalize that? What is the strategy development and the think through to those key results? And so those are the three areas that our toolkit um, is focusing on. Uh, Elizabeth covered a lot of that. I just say three things as themes as I talk about this with colleagues. I think we shouldn't look at inclusion as a business practice any differently than we look at finance, technology, communications. Like it's a practice, right? So. There's a fundamental belief that we're going to do right. We're going to do good by doing good, right? So we're good people and we should start there. You will get things wrong, just like I get math problems wrong, right? You will say the wrong thing. You will make a mistake. And that needs to be okay if we're going to change the way that corporations interact with employees. So the first tool is knowledge. Read, write, talk, 
exchange, right? The second tool is, is, is how to. We should not be uncomfortable saying, I have this list of six questions and we're gonna go through a facilitated discussion. I mean, we do that with strategy planning, right? We sit in these big rooms and we go through strategic processes that not all of us love to figure out how we're gonna deploy capital or how we're gonna plan or how we're gonna forecast. Like, you know, finance leaders come to us and give us walks and waterfalls. There are tools that we're okay using in that part of our business. We should be okay using it on the people side as well. And I'll just close, Dave, with your question with this. Again, if inclusion is a practice and we have a baseline expectation, we have to be okay with some of us are going to be overachievers or high potential, if I will steal language from, from, from talent and, and development in this area, while others won't. It'll be a core competency, right? There's a baseline of you got to be able to do this to be here. And then some people are going to hit a flywheel and be able to accelerate and we should celebrate that, reward it, and praise it the way that we do other functions uh, in the business. Yeah, that's a, such a good point is, is to, to enable and recognize and tie it back to performance management, which you know we're seeing a lot of organizations with those performance management goals against this. I think one of the questions that came in, and David, I'll, I'll point this one over to you, is you know, the, the what's in it for me? And it's something that I know you and I have talked about in, in great length, but you know, for leaders that need to be courageous, oftentimes that's a time where people should be courageous and should have action, but often don't. How, what's the bit like, what's the pitch or what's the, the what's in it for me for these colleagues to go and get involved? Like, how would you talk about that? It's really funny. I, I've had a, a change of perspective on this in the last two weeks. Uh, and I know a lot of my colleagues are on the line, so I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to be courageous and be the first to go and say this in a recorded session. The business case for diversity is clear. Like it's just, it's, it's a non-negotiable. We know what the stats are. Diverse companies outperform non-diverse companies by a multiple. I'm in the view now, and this is my perspective, not McKesson's, that we should abandon the business case and we need to adopt the moral case for change on this. Like it's, it is so, and again, I have a bias. I'm an openly gay black executive at a Fortune 500 company. So I have a bias, I'm owning that. It is so mind baffling to me that we have to put numbers against treating people fairly. Like this is everything we've done in society that we're proud of, whether it's equal marriage, whether it's the Civil Rights Act, whether it's bilingualism in Canada, like these were moral cases for change. We wanna be on the right side of history. So I'm confident that our leadership team at McKesson wants to be at the right side of history. And I think the entire, you know, Fortune 500, the TSX 150, we need to start talking about this as right and wrong because fundamentally that's what it is. Absolutely. Uh, in, you know, in 2020, a lot of things have changed. Tools have changed. Future of work has changed. What's the modern approach to create and incorporate networking and mentoring for employees. Uh, maybe Elizabeth, you wanna kick that off and we can pass it to David. So I think it's doing, I think it's um, it's leveraging technology, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunities to do this and oftentimes it's pen to paper, it's Excel files, it's very, it's a manual process and with the, evolution of technology with smart algorithms, with data matching, with intelligence that's there, we have an opportunity to capitalize on that in a really meaningful way to embed it into our systems, our wider talent management systems to be able to track progress and success. And what we're really pushing our business on doing is, is moving from mentorship to sponsorship. What, we, what the data tends to show is that professionals of color are over-mentored, under-sponsored, and so um, being able to capitalize on that and do that in a meaningful, integrated, um, forward-thinking way oftentimes leverages technology because with many mentorship programs and sponsorship programs in general, it, it tends to be time-bound and you do a slate of activities during that time and you expect a different result. Um, and that happens over and over. And sometimes you do get that result, but sometimes there's a longer play and so how do you track that in a meaningful way and bring it to scale so that it's not happening in small pockets of the organization that it's truly cross-pollinating we talk about at thompson reuters no growth flow talent we're getting better at knowing talent within our verticals but um but i think about 
um, opportunities in, in mentorship and sponsorship. Um, by leveraging technology, you can get out of your vertical and really reach into a different space. So David, you talked about you know, having a sponsor pull you and bring you into a space that you might not have recognized and you don't know what you don't know until somebody provides um, that coffee chat or that opportunity to open the door. And technology helps, like I said earlier, get out of your way and think about things differently. Um, and in the matrix organizations that many of us live in today, that's necessary. And, um, and not all of us have gotten quite there yet in, in being able to do it. So that's my thoughts. Yeah, I love that. And we have one minute left, so we have to wrap and we have dozens of questions we couldn't get to, uh, but we will be emailing everybody after to send some follow-up resources. And I think what I'll leave with all of you as a challenge uh, and we'll definitely follow up with an email with some resources to support on these is to Elizabeth's point, you know, how do you use systems to create scale and equitable access to career opportunities and leadership? There's technology that can help us do that so we can think beyond those niche small plays and actually create scale to support all of the people that need this now more than ever. And the second is really, as we think about performance management and as David shared, you know, what gets measured gets done is how do we create an accountability system so that our actions aren't just you know gut feels but we can actually measure those over time uh, so with that those are the two challenges to all of you uh, we do have a, a bunch of resources on all of this but we don't have time to go through it so we'll follow up on email um, thanks again to elizabeth and david for for joining for sharing your stories and for um, opening a dialogue and having such candor in it uh, we've seen questions of people saying they're almost in tears with your stories um, really helpful, uh, powerful, and something uh, that we, we've all learned a lot from. So thanks to you and uh, everybody else have a great week. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, David. Thank